Hi everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How's it going today? Everything's going pretty good here at Camping Land. It's a little bit of a rainy day outside, as you can see behind me. So I wanted to come on today and make the official video about the verdict of the Rosenbaums, what went on that day, list out all the charges. And so just so you know, I'm going to, at the end of the video, and I'll try and go put a timer marker in the description for you, I'm going to go through all the charges and read them out again, just so that we can all kind of have that. Um, so that's it. So without further ado, let's review. Okay, so now the verdict came in around 5 p.m. Eastern Time on August 1st. And before that was going on, you know, when the cameras were still running, we could see Jennifer giving long hugs to people. Uh, now, when the cameras kind of went off at times, depending on what channel you're watching, you could hear crying, sniffling, and this is before anyone came out. So I feel like at that point, maybe there was a realization on their part of this is not probably going to go well. Like they knew they were going away for some time. Um, it was probably a surprise to her how much time, but, you know, we'll see. Now, we all know also, if you're watching this, leading up to the verdict, all throughout the trial, but especially once the jury deliberated, there was so much drama. And, I mean, if there, if somebody sneezed the wrong way, Kareen asked for a mistrial. And, you know, on one hand, I get that's her job. She is supposed to nitpick at every single little tiny thing, so... You know, I get it. But for all of us that were, you know, seeking, you know, justice for Layla, we're just like, no, no, this is not happening. So, you know, the biggest thing was the, the whole interaction between the reporter from the Atlanta Journal approaching the juror. And even that's up for debate now. Like, what really happened? Did the juror approach them? Did they approach the juror? You know, so basically this juror self-reported, hey, I had an interaction with this reporter. They asked me how it was going. And then the next day that came in and apparently the reporter came Came back and said, well, no, that's not what happened. You know, they actually approached me and this is what happened. So, you know, it was just this nightmare. And basically the judge was like, you know what, just to be safe, we're going to have to pull this juror off and we're going to use one of the alternates to replace them. And you know that the defense mall was like mistrial, mistrial, mistrial. And honestly, at first, I thought they were going to get a My heart sunk. My stomach was on the floor. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Like, I mean, you know, because it seemed logical. I was like, at this point, there's so much murkiness with this. I can see the judge going for it. But you know what? Thank God he didn't. Uh, you know, and he just replaced the juror and it was here, let's keep going. But another thing that was interesting in these interactions with Maul, you know, is she was very much watching social media. And that was another thing that she wanted to cause mistrial over, which is, you know, the media's involvement. And so it became very clear that, yeah, they are paying attention to social media. Uh, Alan and I did a podcast on social media in the courtroom, but we did it before all this happened. It was in relation to the Rosenbaum's trial. And so it was interesting to actually get an answer to the, some of the stuff we talked about in this podcast to be like, wow, they're paying attention to some of the things, but not all the things such as let's maybe act a little bit nicer in there. So anyways, so when they replaced this juror, the judge had to tell them to start all over again. And we were just like, absolutely not. Now, also what the judge did is he took, you know, got, took rid of the, got rid of the cell phones and he sequestered the jury. So, you know, honestly, I feel like something like this serious of a case, especially when you have a defense that is nitpicking every little detail, it's been drawn out for four years. It's like, go ahead and just sequester the jury, you know, just to be safe so that this kind of stuff doesn't halt things up. Now, Thursday, August 1st, when they came back with a verdict, uh, the jury did not, they declined their morning break. They took a two-hour lunch, and they declined the afternoon break. And then, sure enough, around 5 o'clock, like I said, 5 p.m., they came up with the verdict. Now, we only saw an angle of Jennifer and Joseph, like, from what I was watching, but it did appear that they started to cry at certain points and, you know, actually finally showed a little bit of emotion. Now, after the jury read through, the foreman stood up, you know, the judge does what they do, and they read off the 49 charges. And again, I'm going to read those in a few minutes after I kind of go through all my stuff here. Now, one thing I thought was interesting is the foreman went through them. It was good. Now, the first few charges were like not guilty. And again, my heart sunk, my stomach sunk. And I'm sure Jennifer and Joseph were over there like, yes. But then they started reading them off. And it was not good. So, you know... I, I'm going to do some more research at some point on the whole aspect of, you know, why didn't they get found for the first couple? But, I mean, they it, 
it's irrelevant at this point because of the charges they got them on. So, but, you know, they did that. And then, of course, Kareem Mole wanted to have the jury polled. This is very normal. They went through all those motions. Everyone said it is what it is. And, you know, the judge thanked the jury. And the courtroom rose and stood, and the jury left. And during this time, you know, Joe mostly kept his head down. It appeared like they were holding hands, but I couldn't completely see. Uh, I mean, and they were, I mean, this was, you know... This was the moment. I mean, they knew. They, especially Jennifer, because the charge she got, it was either life or life without parole. So, I mean, they knew for her, for sure. Now, they hit Joe with so many. I mean, it had to be a level of, it's not good for him either. But they probably knew Jen's never walking out of there. So, you know, very emotional moment for them because basically they're now having to be accountable for what they did. Now, the judge decides he's going to go directly into sentencing and mull request sentencing at a later date. I mean, she's just like, hi, can we make an appointment? Uh, maybe two weeks out. Thursdays aren't good for us. You know, and I'm sitting here, I'm like, "That's this isn't how that works. I mean, she didn't really say that part. I'm being dramatic. But the fact that she even asked, you know, could I'd like to request that sentencing be set out to a later date. You know, and basically she's like, well, we have people that we, we weren't anticipating this. And we have people that we want to speak and yada, yada, yada. Well, luckily for her, the state was also like, look, we're gathering up some, you know, impact statement people. And so the judge said, you know what? We're going to take a 10 minute recess. I'm going to go look over this and decide the sentence. Y'all get your people together. And that's what they did. Now, when they took this break, the Rosenbaums were handcuffed and taken into the back. And I'm sure now if you were watching, once they're guilty, it's like their state custody at that point. So if you notice the, the guards and stuff took a little bit of a different stance because they very well could have been like, oh, we're going to go out to the bathroom here or whatever. And it would have been like, mm, no, that's not how that works. Sorry. So let's discuss the impact statements. You know, this trial has never ceased to amaze me in each step of the way, all the way down to the impact statements. And I mean, I'm just like, I have not seen a trial in a long time where my mouth is on the ground. So let's just review these real quick. And we're going to actually start with the state, the, the victims in this, the, the true victims. So the first woman was her aunt, was Layla's aunt Cat, is what she went by. Uh, she, sp she spoke to the suffering that the girls went through. Uh, and she also did this really beautiful kind of like, you know, not a poem, but just a speech or whatever about what Layla would be like. Uh, she also talks about the grief cycle and she, at the end of it, asks that they be sentenced to life without parole or at least a gen or, you know, at that point. But she wants the maximum sentence for them. The second woman that got up there, she talked about, you know, the fact that they tried to make Millie out to be a liar. You know, she speaks to the fact that Jennifer was a huge liar to begin with. And she talks about, you know, how the Rosenbaums have been free this whole time. And that has to be like a smack into the victim's faces. The fact that she's been going free. Because remember, these people probably know more information than the public knows about this. So if we're sitting here saying, yeah, it's pretty obvious they're guilty, they have even more information that probably is not allowed to get out. Yeah, but this, she also goes into how all the adults failed them, the system failed them, and then she asked for the court not to fail them. And I thought that was a good touch. And again, she asked for the maximum sentence. Uh, the great aunt gets up there, and she's going to read Peggy Banks' impact statements and she reads a list off of how their acts have damaged the family she reads all the things that she'll never be that Layla will never be able to do now and it's very emotional um and she's scared for the long-term trauma that Millie is going to experience the next is another great a uh, uh, Kim Smith the great great aunt of Layla and she speaks of the last time that she saw Millie uh, she speaks about the cumbersome of the case and how heavy it's weighed on the family uh, and before Layla died and after Layla died is how they will refer to their lives now, which I thought was very, you know, uh, very uh, an emotional thing. And I mean, obviously that is the way they're going to view their life now before and after this event. Uh, but she does, you know, she asked for the fullest punishment and she's prayed for their souls and says that she has never seen any remorse from them at all during this. And I think that's the clincher with this is that we haven't seen, we've seen, especially with a defense like Mole, who no accountability, no nothing. It's a, these people have been wrongly accused when there is just glaring evidence. But not only that, it's been done in such a nasty way. And we kind of see maybe some of the origins of that when we get down to 
some of the other impact statements from the defense. But first, before we get to that, Tessa gets up there. She's the last uh, person on the state side to speak. And bless her heart, she's just heartbroken. And I'm sure that, I mean, that moment to see that her child got justice was major for her. So, you know, she she gets up there, she's crying. You know, I, I was proud of her for even being able to get up there. I don't know if I could have done that. You know, she talks about this opportunity that they were giving, but instead of, you know, utilizing it, they took her life. And I think that's one thing, too, because like I've said before, you know, Matt and I were looking into fostering, and we've been in that system to a degree. And, uh, you know, we're sitting here, we're like, so many people want kids, and for her to seek Tessa and them out and do all this, and then murder the kid, and abuse, you know, the other Millie, you're just like, why? I mean, why? Like, what kind of evil does that? Uh, and then Tessa says, you know, she's like, I blame myself because of her actions. Uh, because her actions led them to live in their home. But she says that she's finally gotten to a place where she doesn't blame herself anymore. She can start to say, you know, okay, this was not, you know, they're the ones who killed her. And I thought that was a beautiful realization. So, that happens. And then the defense brings up their witnesses. And the first one is Mr. Rosenbaum, Joe's father. Okay, so first of all, I, I mean, I, I just, please hold. I have to take a sip of coffee over this one. I mean, I still, now to this day, this is Saturday I'm filming this. So this is a few days ago. I was literally sitting here at this chair listening to it with my headphones, and when he started talking, I went, it was literally the look on my face. So he gets up there, and he blames Tessa, the biological mother, who we just heard from, who literally has just said that she no longer, she's finally gotten to this place where she doesn't blame herself for this. And he gets up there and goes into a thing about how drugs and alcohol are bad. Okay. I mean, he sounded just like that guy from South Park. And, you know, he's like, this would have been prevented in the first place if she hadn't been addicted to drugs and alcohol. And asked, you know, for the his for Jennifer and Jen to get the, um, the minimum sentence. And you're just, I mean, I can't imagine the glares that man got in the courtroom. I hope he turned around and left after that. Because, I, I mean, I don't understand this thing that we're seeing recently of people on, I understand, and let me just pause here for a second. I know I'm, I got too many thoughts going. So, I don't understand the thing that we see recently of these people getting up in court during these impact statements and blaming the victims. I, 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 it blows my mind. It blows my mind. So, that being said, I also respect that that's his son and that they, you know, and Jennifer is his daughter-in-law. His family is going to have their version of events that they have most likely only heard through Joe and Jennifer. And let's be honest, they were probably completely filtered through Jennifer. But no matter what, that's his son. So, I, I can respect that. You know, but things being said like that, especially before the judge has gone out and given the sentence. I'm just like, what would make you think that's even an okay thing to say? When you get home on the car ride home and you're talking to whoever's in the car with you and those are your personal private thoughts, you're entitled to those. Absolutely. Go ahead and have that conversation then about how it's so-and-so's fault and your son didn't have anything to do with it and da 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 But during victim impact statements to get up there and blame the mother... I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, and so and then on top of it, I'm like, and how did you think that that was going to get your son off of anything? You know, how do you think that was going to even help? If anything, it made the judge think even worse of them. And he said that at the end. So his, he, he was shocking. Now, what's even more shocking <laughs> and telling is the next person who gets up. I do not know who exactly this person was. He was someone from the church. I don't know if it was the preacher or just someone that worked with Jen at the programs. He had said he only knew Jen for six months for six months. This has been their whole MO this whole time where they literally get strangers up there to testify. And he, he she is the most Christian lady he has ever known. Swear she didn't kill that child. Doesn't believe she could have killed that child. And I'm just like, bless your heart, sir. She has you swindled up one side and down the next. And again, this is the narcissistic entitlement of it because I'm like, it would have been better for you never to put him up there, getting up there saying he knew you for six months. I mean, it, 
should be a shame for even letting him get up there and speak. I, I mean, it's just because what that says to us is she doesn't know anybody else longer than nobody wanted to testify for this woman. That's what's telling about this. If she ever got another trial, nobody would testify. Nobody. So, I, I mean, that's the thing. It's just like, don't put these people up there. But I'm sure she was insistent and maybe Kareem was like, okay, but I mean, it's like, reel your client in. Now, another lady gets up there then, uh, Casey, and she does doesn't know the gen that was portrayed in the courtroom. See, she feels the justice system has got this wrong. And, you know, people have made a mistake. And, you know, has Jen has done more in her life than most others have. And she asked for mercy. And, again, each one of these people brings something like this. Don't get up here and try and say how... Uh, you know, Jen's done so much more in her life than all these other people have and make it like a she's better than. No. People have done way more than Jen, honey. You know, and let's be honest, a lot of people are sitting here talking about her like she got what she wanted because they felt sorry for her. We heard that time and time again. So there's a level of, you know, you get a trophy because we feel bad for you going on with her. I'm not trying to negate that she, you know, from the circumstances she came from, yes, she did some great things, or not great, but, you know, she accomplished a lot from where she came from. I get that. But don't get up there in the impact statement and try and make it up. Well, she's done more than any of you. It's just not helping. And it just goes to show because this lady came off as cocky. And I'm like, okay, again, it's just showing these are the people she surrounds herself with. You know, this is what she is surrounded with. People that know her for six months, people that victim blame, people that get up there and tell everyone else how much better she is than them. I mean, you know. And then, of course, it would not be it would not be the, the impact statements without Summer getting up there speaking. So Summer gets up there, she's crying, uh, nothing was wrong with the kids, you know, her son's gonna be in pieces, because he, and this is the part that I found, so, you know, with Summer, um, she says, my son's gonna be in pieces because he'll never see them again, or, I mean, whatever you choose to do, and I'm just like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I get it, I mean, she realized that, but that slip, that Feridian slip or whatever, whatever you call that, you know, I'm just like, yeah, she's probably not gonna see him again. So, then, you know, Joe's mother gets up there to speak, and, you know, she didn't prepare a speech. She speaks from the heart, and she feels in their core that they were good parents. Uh, they would never do this. This was an accident. You know, please be lenient. Uh, she talks about Joe's cystic fibrosis and how he doesn't have a long life, and she knows that, that he's going to basically die very quickly because he won't get the treatment that he's supposed to in prison. So, there's that. Uh, and, and again, you know, I feel like some, I feel like Joe's, especially the mother, I don't know about the father, for someone to get up there and say that, I don't know if he'll come around. I think what's going to happen is this. I think when Joe, now, cause now think about this. So Joe and, uh, what's her name? Jennifer have been in prison for a couple of days, jail, wherever they're waiting to go to prison. And I'm not sure if like they've gotten, cause usually what happens is when this takes place, you, you go to the county jail or however that situation is there and you get shipped out to, you know, the, the the prison that you go to, and from there they decide what long-term prison you're going to go to. So, depending on when that bus runs and stuff like that, they're either at the prison already or at county jail. But regardless, they're incarcerated. And they're going through that, oh my god, oh my god, this is the rest of my life. I mean, let's be honest, Joe's in there for 30 years, plus 20 years probation. I mean, come on. You know, he's going to be retirement age by the time he gets out. And they're not in there on the prettiest of charges. And he was a correctional officer. It's not going to be an easy 30 years for him. So they're getting in there and they're separated. And they're coming to these realizations of, oh my God, and Jen, this is the rest of her life. Joe's probably going to come around to, oh my gosh, you know, that venom that the father spit towards Tessa, I think will all be directed towards Jen. Because we're going to probably, or not we, his parents are probably going to start hearing a different story of what went down because Jen's not in his ear. Does that mean he's not guilty? No, he knew what was going on. You can't tell me that he didn't. I do think probably in the beginning he believed Jen. I, I mean, who wouldn't? You're not going to think that your spouse is like, you know, beating these children like this. But at some point, an awareness came about with it, and he was just as guilty by leaving them alone and by standing by and watching this happen. And he probably beat them too. I mean, because remember also how the, his co worker said the thing about uh, when he was like, well, yeah, the little one's really clingy. You know that Jim was doing uh, the sick stuff to those children, and he was coming home from work and they were clinging to him. And I guess this annoyed him or something. So. 
you know, the whole thing is just obnoxious. But I think he's going to realize, oh my gosh, he's not going to have Genesis filter. And his parents are going to start hearing a different story because clearly they had no idea what was going on either. And even if they did, I don't think they would want to accept accountability for it because the father was very, so quick to blame, you know, Tessa for all this. Anyways, now... So they, they have the recess, the state gets back up there. And the judge comes out, the state gets back up. And basically the state goes into vacating and, you know, because some of these sentences are type things where it's like, well, this one goes into this one and combined. So they go through all this kind of stuff. And basically to be like, this is what we're sentencing people on. You know, these are the things that they're getting, they're getting sentenced for. So the state says that the jury clearly deliberated long and hard. And the state asked for Jen life without parole plus 780 years to run consecutive. And Joseph faced 410 years, so they asked for 70 years, 50 years in custody, and the rest on probation. Then Mole gets up there to speak. Yeah, Mole talks about his cystic fibrosis, that his lifespan isn't good, says he was found to be negligent, not doing the crime. Uh, there's no evidence that Joe knew or should have known any of this stuff was going on. Uh, she asked for a much less sentence, considering that it is for negligence. It says he was working two jobs says the evidence uh, shows that he was good to the girls when he was around. She doesn't think that warrants 70 years. She asked him to consider five years for him. And, you know, she says, we aren't what we do or what we fail to do on one day. I mean, th just the audacity of some of the things that she comes up with. After you've heard all this evidence, and she... We're not defined by what we do a day. Well, guess what? Layla's life was, you know, sorry to say. You know, guess what? Millie is going to have some pretty long-term impactful things on this. So it just blows my mind. But so they continue. Then she goes into the fact of neither of them have a record. They're coming to you with no background. I still think, I still think that Jennifer has a sealed record because it was in her youth. Whatever was going to prevent her under her maiden name from getting those children's and going through proper channels, you know, remember with trying to get the foster care system going, whatever is on her record is on her record, but it's sealed. And so technically, Mole can say they have no record, but I have a feeling if that was opened up, pe mm -mm. People would be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm sure she did do this to these kids. You know, it wouldn't even be a question before all this trial came up. Yeah, you know, she says that, you know, Jennifer was a law student, a good one. You know, she did a, a lot for a lot of people. You know, the evidence shows that she loved them, gave them love and care. Uh, you know, she understands responsibility. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> are you serious? Uh, you know, she says that Jennifer has always blamed herself for this. It, basically, she says, please consider a life sentence for Jen. Uh, it goes into her childhood, foster care, all this type of stuff. So, you know, the state speaks again. And, you know, another thing that Mole said real quick is, you know, like, this is not the most, I cannot remember the word, like, heinous crime this court has seen or whatever. When the state gets back up there, you know, he says that, you know, that what we're all thinking, you know, Joe and Jen's negligence cost Layla her life. And he says, this isn't something that just happened one day. You know, this was like, and I'm glad he said that because it's like this accumulated up and went into this. It was a pattern. That's what he said. It was a pattern. And then he says, and then that's the word. He says, and to say that this isn't the most egregious thing this court will ever hear is astonishing. And it is. I mean, Mole was the icing on the cake for those two. You could not have picked a worse lawyer for a crime like this. She just, I mean, this woman, she came off like she just had no soul. And she might be a wonderful person behind closed doors. I don't know. I don't know her personally. I just see what I see. I see what I see. And I'm just like, this isn't a good luck. You know, not for your clients, not for you as a person. Uh, so, you know, it was just awful. So the state ends his thing going into the very descriptive details of Layla's last hour of life basically and it's sad and it's heartbreaking so it's just you know it's awful so th the judge sentences them so jen essentially gets life in prison plus 40 years and you know she has 30 days to file an appeal so on and so forth and now he sentenced her to some different things like you know like counts 10 through 40 is a 20 year sentence to be served concurrent but consecutive to count six and this that, and the other so the end result is life plus 40 so she ain't leaving. You know, she's 30 years old. Even if she got that life conviction turned over, she's got another 40 years. So, I mean, it's just, it's not going to happen. And again, like I said, even if she appeals this, does anything like that, A, he was doing her a favor by saying life, you know, with the possibility of parole. But he made sure she wasn't, even if she got out of that, he was, got her on the 40 years. 
Joe got basically a grand total of 50 years, but he got 30 of it to be served incarcerated and 20 of it to be on probation. So Joe will be the one that can actually, I mean, he'll walk out of there if he lives. Uh, I imagine he's going to have to be in like special confinement, you know, like a special unit for, you know, people like him, based like child molesters, child abusers, people like this, uh, rapists, things, very, you know, touchy crimes that don't go over well in prison. So, but he has a chance of getting out. I think he will appeal. If either of them have a chance to, I think it will be him that can appeal. And if he does, we might get a whole other version of events that we never saw because Jen had her, you know, claws in this situation. So... I want to talk about what the judge had to say at the end of it. And I was like, thank God he said something. So I got it pretty much verbatim, but if everybody, anyone else, if I missed a word or something, drop it in the comments, let me know. So here we go. It is deeply frustrating for the court to hear family members of defendants quarrel with the verdict rendered in this case. This case was carefully tried. I am deeply concerned of the lack of recognition on behalf of the defendant's family, of the scope of the tragedy, and of the cause of the tragedy. I've looked at this case for a long time. I'll tell you it's one of the worst, most horrible crimes and outcomes that anyone could ever experience or dream of experiencing. And so I just want to say that I feel for and am deeply pained for your loss, and I hope you find a way to recover. And, but that, that was it. They were let out. I mean, it kind of makes me a little teary-eyed reading that. For him to acknowledge the heinousness of this and to get up there and say it's one of the most horrible crimes he's seen, you know, for Mole to sit there and downplay this. And now I believe, the, Mole asked a question after that, and I almost want to say that she said, and again, if any of y'all know the exact question, because we had a really hard time hearing it, that she said something to the effect of, could they be out on bond until something, you know, until the appeal or something? And he was like, I'm not going to do that. I mean, he was done with her. He was being nice. Obviously, he can't say anything to her because that, that would be complete grounds for mistrial. But you know, he was over her. I mean, it's just, it, when you come into court work every day and you're seeing these pictures and listening to this stuff and you have somebody sitting here saying this is no big deal these people have been wrongfully accused let's call a kid a liar and all these like very educated people just you know liars and all this i mean that's a hard pill to swallow so my hat's off to the people in that courtroom the prosecution the judge all those people for keeping a poker face on when they needed to to make sure the job got done because that would whew, that would be hard for me i can say that so that being said I'm going to now read through the counts, and we're going to go through the counts, each one, and talk about guilty, not guilty, who's guilty, not guilty. So let's jump into that. The first charge was malice murder, not guilty. The second charge was felony murder, not guilty. The third charge was aggravated assault, guilty. The fourth charge was felony murder, not guilty. The fifth charge, cruelty to children in the first degree, guilty. The sixth charge, felony murder, guilty. That's where, that's where it was boom, boom. Once they hit that, the felony murder chart, it was like, whoa, you know. Because honestly, at first, she probably was sitting there like, oh my God, oh my God, I got off. And then aggravated, you know, aggravated assault, okay. And then the murder charge, boom, done. So, anyways, let's continue. Charge number seven, aggravated battery, guilty. Charge number eight, murder in the second degree, uh, Joseph, guilty. Number nine, cruelty to children in the second degree, Joseph, guilty. Number 10, aggravated assault, Jennifer, guilty. Number 11, cruelty to children in the first degree, Jen, guilty. Number 12, aggravated assault, both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 13, cruelty to children in the first degree, both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 14, <laughs> aggravated assault, both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 15 is cruelty to children in the first degree. Both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 16 is aggravated assault. And both, or no, aggravated assault 16 and Jen is guilty. Uh, number 17, cruelty to children in the first degree. Jen is guilty. Number 18, aggravated assault. Uh, both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 19 is cruelty to children in the first degree. Uh, both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 20, aggravated assault. Uh, Jen is guilty. Number 21, cruelty to children in the first degree. Jen is guilty. 
Number 22, aggravated assault. Uh, both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 23, cruelty to children in the first degree. Both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 24, cruelty to children in the first degree. Uh, Jen is guilty. Number 25, children or cruelty to children in the first degree. Jen is guilty. Number 26, aggravated assault. Both Jen and Joe are guilty. Number 27 is cruelty to children in the first degree. Both Jen and Joe are guilty. 28 is aggravated assault and Jen is guilty. 29, cruelty to children in the first degree. Uh, Jen is guilty. 30, aggravated assault. Uh, Jen and Joe are both guilty. 31, cruelty to children in the first degree. Uh, Jen and Joe are guilty. 32, aggravated assault. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. 33, cruelty to children in the first degree. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. 34, cruelty to first children in the first degree. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. Number 35, aggravated battery. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. Number 36, aggravated battery. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. Number 37, cruelty to children in the first degree. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. Number 38, cruelty to children in the first degree. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. 39, aggravated battery. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. 40, cruelty to children in the first degree. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. 41, aggravated battery. Jen is guilty, Joe is not guilty. 42, cruelty to children in the first degree. Jen guilty and Joe are guilty, both guilty on 42. 43, aggravated battery. Jen is guilty. 44, aggravated assault. Both are guilty, Jen and Joe are guilty. 45, cruelty to children in the first degree. Both are guilty. 46, aggravated assault. Both are guilty. 47, cruelty to children in the first degree. Both are guilty. 48, children, cruelty to children in the second degree. Both are guilty. And 49, cruelty to children in the second degree. Uh, both are guilty. So that's the charges again. As you see, they banged Jennifer up on those. And again, the first ones where it was like, not guilty, not guilty, and then aggravated assault, you know, you're like, okay, so they're just going to hit her with the lesser charges, which they could still keep her in prison for life over those. Yeah, but once they started hitting those murder charges, and I mean, for Joe, the same thing too. I mean, clearly, what the jury had to do that was so cumbersome with those is go back with t dates and times when they were together on this and then this and that. And I'm sure it was very complicated and tedious to go through. So, but you know, at the end of the day, we all felt like the jury came back with the right stuff. This case will be going on for a while, I'm sure, because appeals will come up and this and that and the other. But they are where they should be at this time. And Layla has had her day in court. Unfortunately, it came to that. Uh, you know, if you're interested, there's some groups like Layla uh, Justice for Layla and McDaniel on uh, Facebook, where some really awesome people in there. Uh, if you want to learn more about you know the case or meet some wonderful people that are in support of you know Layla and her family and whatnot. So that's it for today's video. I hope everybody's doing well. I am starting to feel a little bit better. I think I just had a really bad cold, uh, and maybe just spending time this time with the Rosen bombs just weighed down heavy on me. I think I don't know. Anyways, there are lots of description, lots of descriptions. There's lots of links in the description. Uh, now, we do have another po a podcast that's completely separate from these that talks about different subjects about the Rosenbaum case. So the, that's down there. Check that out. Also, if you want to subscribe, don't forget to do that and hit the dinner bell next to it. And that way you'll know when I'm in Sofa Land to hang out with you. That's it. I appreciate you choosing to hang out with me. And I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.